Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Rider podcast. I've got another treat for you today because we've got Steve Newman, founder of Scalar, joining me on the podcast. And what makes Steve incredibly interesting is that his first company was acquired by Google and turned into Google Docs and Google Drive, two mainstay Google products now used by 800 million people daily. And after four successful years at Google, he left the company to go on and create Scalar and tackle a problem even the best minds at Google couldn't figure out how to solve. And this is one of those episodes. It's a great story. And because of that, I'm paranoid about revealing too many spoilers before the interview even starts. So I'll catch up with you at the end of the interview. But right now, buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to San Francisco so we can speak with Steve Newman, founder of Scalar. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Steve. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yes. So I'm a founder of a startup called Scalar. And I always describe myself as an engineer, but Then I find myself starting companies and uh, I was the initial CEO of Scalar. So um, I went kind of one of those miscellaneous people, but uh, kind of an engineer at heart. I think you're underselling yourself a little there. I mean, you do have an inspiring backstory. I think it was your first company was acquired by Google and turned into Google Docs and Google Drive, two mainstay products now used by 800 million people daily all around the world. I mean, that's got to feel pretty good, right? And what, what did you learn from that, that chapter in your life? Uh, that, that certainly was a fun ride. You know, I think we were, we were just kind of in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, it was one of those ideas that, you know, kind of the time had finally arrived for, for something like Google Docs to work. Uh, and actually, uh, my co-founders and I, had, um, that, was, that was something like the seventh startup that I've been part of, um, certainly the most successful. But we'd uh, taken a swing at that collaboration problem before. Uh, but being able to do it on the web, which was kind of possible for the first time uh, in the mid-2000s there, um, that was where it really took off. We, uh, you know, just kind of caught the, the right wave at the right time. And, and it just became a kind of a classic intership, uh, sorry, internet rocket ship ride. Um, you know, I remember there was one night when we had just kind of done a soft, soft launch of the prototype. Um, I went to bed one night. We had about 100 registered users. I woke up the next morning uh, and we had 1,000 registered users. Wow. And, uh, and climbing fast. And it turned out that um, TechCrunch, which we had never even heard of because it had just gotten started, but TechCrunch had blogged about us uh, uh, that morning. And, uh, uh, and then we were just hanging on for dear life. So, you know, kind of some things, things we learned from that. Um, <laughs> we learned all, all kinds of things from, from that experience. But a couple of things that I really focus on, one is... Um, when you're trying to build something new, it's easy to get caught up in looking at all the competition or the comp- or the potential competition, and that kind of became a distraction for us uh, when we were working on Rightly was was the name of the startup. Um, there were it seemed like once we got started, suddenly it seemed like literally every week someone else was announcing some kind of web based word processing solution, but none of them really felt like to felt right to us. And we decided to just focus on the problem we were trying to solve and the people we were trying to solve it for. And, and, and that I, I found to be a really good lesson because you can always find something that looks like it's what you're doing. But if, if your customers don't think it's a solution, then, then you probably don't need to worry about it. And so that, that's something I've really clung to is, you know, eval- kind of evaluate your market by, by the customer and not by who else might be, might be trying to solve that problem. Um, and the other thing that I think really helped rightly work out for us is we were we were solving a problem that we we were the customer. We were solving a problem that we had. Uh, and the way we thought about it was it was the emailing word files problem. You're trying to collaborate with someone on a document. Inevitably, you're mailing the file back and forth, and you lose track of is that version nine or version ten, and who has the current copy? And oh no, we both edited it. And um, you know, my co-founders and I had been sort of hating that problem for 10 years. 
And, uh, and so that was the itch we were trying to scratch. And I think, you know, when you really, when you really have the, the itch that, that you're, that you're trying, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, it tends to, to lead to, to better outcomes. Absolutely. So many valuable lessons in what you just said there. And, and also parts of it sounded almost like an episode of Silicon Valley. I don't know if you watch that show <laughs> where you're going to bed, you've got a hundred users and you, you refresh in the mornings, a thousand, you're on TechCrunch, et cetera. It was definitely the most Silicon Valley uh, episode of, of my career. <laughs> um, you know, not quite, but almost to the point of, you know, chopping holes in the wall to, to run more servers <laughs> in. <laughs> Um, we definitely had that, you know, there, there was a, all kinds of, I'll say, hijinks as we were scrambling to, to keep up with, uh, with the growth. And this is, obviously, you, you were talking that as well there about swinging to solve problems. And you're doing that again because you left Google to create Scalar and tackle a problem that even the best minds at Google couldn't figure out how to solve. But before we talk about Scalar, can you tell me all about the problem and the story behind wanting to be the guy that solves that problem? Yeah, so you know, so we we're acquired, and now we're at Google, and and suddenly, you know, the product is scaling up massively in both the number of users that we were serving, because you know now we were standing on Google's platform, um, and I you know kind of shouting with their megaphone, um, as well as then the the complexity of the product as it started to you know evolve into Google Drive and integrating with Google Sheets and so forth, and kind of underlying that all that from the technical side, there are. Bunch of uh, sea changes that have been going on in the industry over the last decade or so um, that have been making it easier to build these more complex, large scale applications. And I'm just talking about basic shifts like the move to the cloud, platforms like Kubernetes, serverless. You know, there, there are these evolutions in the way we're architecting our applications, and they that make it much easier to build you know large complex systems. But by the, the flip side of that coin is now we have these large complex systems um, and they're much harder to understand, uh, you know, understand how things are behaving, why it's working well or not working well. Where is that error coming from? Why is performance, you know, off by 30% today? You know, we're, we're giving ourselves the tools to create these much more complicated systems. And then the, the telemetry tools, the tools for keeping tabs on and debugging how, how that system performs weren't keeping up. Um, you know, concretely uh, it, within Google, the team I was on, we were, we counted one day and we were literally using 17 different tools just for visibility, uh, just to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, all tools that would gather some kind of data to, to show us what was going on under the hood in these applications. And we were just drowning, uh, you know, keeping the system running was, was starting to take almost more time than actually building the system. You know, the, the coding, the development team was completely distracted. So, so that was the problem. And, you know, I think just for whatever reason, no one at, at Google was really focusing on it. And, um, but I, you know, I, I get very frustrated by problems that seem solvable and aren't being solved. And, and so that just sort of rung my bell. Um, and, you know, I wasn't, you know, that wasn't my job description at Google. And, um, but after I left, like, this was sort of a problem that stuck with me. And, um, and it felt solvable. It felt like with all the scale and, and these new tools that were being developed, that really there was room for new approaches to the problem and, and just no one had done it yet. So how does Scalar tackle those problems? And would you go as far as to say that you've fixed them or is that still very much work in progress and a continuously improving and evolving process? So Alan Turing first described the Turing machine in 1936. So that was 83 years ago. Uh, and in that time, I don't, I don't think any piece of software has ever actually been finished. Yeah. Uh, cer certainly we're not done, but, but we've made some good progress. And so at heart, you know, I talked about, you know, there were these 17 different tools um, and that was things like uh, log management and metrics and distributed tracing and error tracking, the different systems that would gather information from the operating system or the network or the application and so forth and, and make it available in one way or another. And, um, there were a lot, and in truth, like when you really, if you kind of take a first principles look at what's going on here, a lot of these tools are kind of specific hacks to solve a specific problem, like uh, like error tracking tools, you know, take a very narrow kind of data, just stack traces or, or exception reports from an application and give you a few uh, special purpose tools for 
for slicing and dicing that. And it's useful, but it's, but it's very specific. And then someone else comes along and they have a problem with their network and they build some kind of special purpose tool for pulling data out of the network perform, you know, pulling network performance data and analyzing that. Um, but under the hood, oh, these problems are all pretty similar. You, you're getting floods of data from uh, you know, some distributed application. It's all time sequence data um, and, you, and you wanna be able to graph it and, and you do other kinds of basic analyses with it. And so we built at heart, it's one way of looking at it is at heart, it's, it's a log management solution. So we kind of picked that tool out of the toolkit. But the reason we did that is that um, logs are really just, at the end of the day, are just events, uh, you know, can be from an application or an operating system or a network or whatever. But it's, it's really, it's a very general purpose way of thinking about gathering data from these applications uh, and, and these systems. And so that, that's, we, you know, we, we felt that if we could build a truly scalable log management solution, it would remove the need for a lot of these other specific hacks just to track errors or just to track some other specific thing. And um, the challenge uh, conventionally was that it's, you know, log data can be very, very large, you know, terabytes, petabytes, and it's very hard to work with that in a performant, uh, in a performant way. But we found a couple of, you know, kind of one thing I learned at Google was not to be afraid to take a first first principles look at a problem and, you know, maybe come at it from a new angle. And um, we found a couple of ways to do that with logs. Um, and one, you know, you know, I talked about how the, the move to the cloud uh, is one of the big trends that's, you know, creating these increased challenges, but it also opened up kind of the road to the solution because there's a real economy of scale from running a log, log management solution the way we do as a centrally hosted service where instead of each individual customer having some little cluster of whatever software they're using for log management, we run one very large cluster um, and we've architected our system so that um, all of our customers get to use that. It's kind of like when you uh, run a web search on Google, you know, in that 100 milliseconds or whatever that Google is processing your search, literally 3,000 servers in a Google data center might participate in your search. Um, and obviously, you know, that's vastly disproportionate to kind of your personal search needs, but Google is able to multitask that. So, you know, you get the whole cluster for a millisecond and then someone else gets the cluster for a millisecond and every user gets this massive brute force engine for a very brief moment of time. Um, and that was one of the key things uh, that, we, that we did that allowed us to really kind of change the game in terms of performance and make it practical to use logs as a, as a much uh, kind of much more flexible solution that, that um, doesn't require all these little special purpose tools to supplement. So can I ask that you walk the listener through how to get the most out of Scalar and also just to help them visualize how it would fit in their organization, wherever they're located? Yeah. So the kind of the, the basic answer is we're a log management solution. Um, almost everyone has some kind of log management solution today. And, um, and so we're a, a drop in replacement. Um, and so, you, know, you connect it into your applications and systems. We pull in the log files, uh, move them to our hosted uh, operation, and then you know you can log into the log into our website and run the searches and and do all the analysis that you know probably you know there are people in your organization that are already doing. Um, and then and the kind of the benefits there is much faster and easier to use, and a lot of the ease of use comes just from the speed and um, and so people start relying on it more. Um, it goes from kind of a tool of last resort to a tool of first resort. People are able to be more proactive about investigating issues. Um, but kind of more, that's sort of the boring, straightforward answer. I think where things get more interesting is uh, in, in two places. First, because, you know, and this was something we didn't necessarily anticipate when we started Scalar, but when something is really fast and we can usually give answers uh, in less than one second, people run a search through their logs on Scalar they get an answer in less than a second, it becomes much more approachable. Uh, and people who aren't, who wouldn't normally use that tool or don't think of themselves as experts at that will go and try it out and they'll make some mistakes because that's what you do with a new tool. But when you can get this really quick feedback, oh, that wasn't the rated, right thing I meant to search for. Let me try this. Oh yeah, that was it. When that happens very quickly, um, it's kind of like, you know, again, you know, Google web search you go researching something, you run a search, if you type the wrong thing, it's no big deal, you, you just type something else. 
Traditionally, uh, with log management, you might be waiting minutes or longer to get your answer. Um, and it, it's very frustrating to climb a learning curve in that environment. But we found that uh, Scalar makes things much more accessible. And so we start to see other communities within an organization, the support team um, or you know, people on the business side will go in and um, maybe with a little help from someone else to get started, but then very quickly on their own, they can go and research uh, things they're interested in, like a customer support person can look at what a user was doing when, the, when that user reported a problem. And so that's one thing, you know, so now we encourage our customers to really, you know, make the tool available across the organization because people start finding new uses for it. The other one, and this is, this is near and dear to my heart, is that, you know, people get used to using logs as kind of step two. You'll have some other solution, maybe a metrics tool to give you as your early warning system where you run alerts or your dashboard system where you're kind of keeping an eye on the system. And then when those metrics or alerts show you something that you need to look at, then you move over to the logs and start digging in. But that's very cumbersome having to juggle different tools. And I mentioned how you know, we were juggling these 17 different tools at, at Google and you know, that was one of the big uh, frustrations. Um, we've built this system where it's uh, performant enough that it can be used for those traditional early line applications like dashboarding and alerting. Um, and so we encourage people to think about log management as the place where you cannot just end an investigation, but where you can start the investigation. And the benefit, there's a couple of benefits from that. One is the, it's very flexible. With metric solutions, you're often limited to kind of the metrics that you've defined in advance, the things that you've decided in advance to measure. And, and that starts to limit your thinking. Um, oh, like, I'd really like to know if this ever happens. I'd love to have an alert on that, but it's not one of our metrics. And yeah, I could go do some work. And then next week we would roll out the change where we'd have that metric, but that's too much trouble. By using a log management solution where all of the detailed data is there um, and you can ask new questions on the fly, um, it, it kind of un you know, unlocks uh, that flexibility a little bit where people don't you know, stop feeling hamstrung by the, or limited by the, the specific data that they've decided to make available. Um, and it also allows for a direct connection when you see that blip on a dashboard or you get that alert notice and you want to investigate. When, you're, when that initial interaction came in a tool that has your detailed log data, um, it's much easier to then dive in and do the investigation. Um, you can, uh, the way we've built, built this tool, you can, you can look at a graph and, and click on it and drill down and start to see all the detailed data that's behind it um, in the same tool. And another thing that I love to do on here is bust a few myths. So in a world of DevOps, are, are there any misconceptions that we can finally lay to rest or, or anything that's been bothering you and you want to set the record straight? So the, the thing that comes to mind, it, it really goes to what I was just talking about uh, yeah. with metrics and logs. You know, there's been this idea that, so, you know, people have been relying on metrics for the first, first line of visibility because, um, you know, because, you know, log man management solutions had been uh, struggling to, to keep up with modern scale. And so there's been this move to, towards metrics. And, and metrics are a great idea. You know, the basic idea there is if you have questions, you know that you're going to ask repeatedly, what's, my, what's the error rate of the service? How is this system performing? Whatever. Um, then, then instead of trying to wade into a huge mass of data every time you want to answer that question, um, just kind of pull out a summary in advance. Let's, met, you know, let's just count the number of errors in the system or, or you know, whatever the metric is I want to look at. Let's just sort, let's, you know, distill that in advance. Um, and then whenever I want to look at it, uh, you know, it's right there. It's, you know, I can bring it up quickly. Um, but then the, then somehow this has gotten mutated into that's the only way to work. And, and you, you know, you should only use metrics and that's kind of the only practical kind of data. And, and, and people went from there to, well, if all I have is metrics, then metrics must be all I need. And, um, and, and, and that can be dangerous because almost by definition, uh, metrics are a way of measuring the questions that you had thought of in advance and, and that are kind of, you know, this, uh, you know, and don't change much. And so they tend to hide novel, pro you know, if there's a novel problem or a problem hiding in a corner of your system, um, it, it may not show up. So, you know, you may have a metric that shows that 99.9% .9 of the requests to your service uh, are successful, 
Uh, but what that won't show you is that you have eight users who can't use the system at all because there's something corrupt about their database record and 100% of the time they try to access your system, it fails. But that's only one, you know, one-tenth of one percent of the overall traffic, so it's not going to show up in a metric. Um, and so kind of this, this idea that, you know, metrics are the only thing that can work, and, and they're, so therefore they are the, all the, they're any, everything you need um, is, uh, is kind of my, my bugaboo. And when I was researching you before you came on today, a couple of other things really stood out for me. And one was your empathetic approach to leadership and innovation, including when you knew that it was time to bring in a new CEO, because I think that's a subject that we don't hear discussed that often. And startup founders are are not too open about it. I mean, can you expand on that? So it was never a goal of mine to to be a CEO. Um, You know, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I, I think of myself as an engineer, um, when we started Scalar, someone had to do it, uh, had to be the CEO, and, and it just sort of fell, fell to me by default. Um, and, you know, I think it you know, worked well in the early days when we were very small, but as, as the company grew, um, I learned two things about being a CEO. I, I don't like it and I'm not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, once we, it was starting around when we probably grew to, we're about 20 people. I was really starting to get in the way um, and I could feel it. You know, I could see, you know, there were you know, things in the organization where we weren't functioning smoothly um, that, that ultimately traced back to me. And, um, you know, it's always a little bit scary to, to change the person at the top of an organization. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, I started to think of it as it's kind of a double or nothing move. Um, you know, the right hire can really uh, turbocharge things and, and set you up for the, for the next stage of growth you know, hiring the wrong person obviously can create serious problems. Um, and so we, we waited until we had, de- we had developed to the point where we were going to be able to attract the right person. And, and then, and so then we started our search. Um, we got really lucky. Um, you know, we, there's a number of boxes that ideally you want to check someone who's just, you know, first of all, you know, a good leader aligned with the vision of the company. And then, and then who, you know, I guess, you know, speaking of personally, you know, we, we, we got lucky and we found someone who is aligned with the vision of what we're building at Scalar and, and who I mesh with really well. Um, and and we, we just really get along well. So you know, our new CEO started at the beginning of January and um, it's been absolutely outstanding for the company. Um, and it's been great for me because now I get to go back to, to things I actually enjoy and, and maybe have a little bit of, of, of talent at. Um, I mean, I'm even getting to, you know, I'm getting to work on the product more. I'm even writing code again. And um, so, you know, it was a little bit scary because you, you know, you have to hope that you're going to find the right person, but it's, it's just been terrific uh, from end to end. Fantastic. And we have talked a lot about your past, but I mean, what's next for Scalar? Is there anything else you can share with us about the road ahead and your future there? So, I, you know, we're always work. you know, I talked about how nothing's ever finished yeah. and, um, you know, we set out with this goal of building a, a solution that was sufficiently scalable and, and performant and flexible to, you know, kind of eliminate that 17 tools problem. And we've made a lot of progress, but there's a lot more to be done. And it, but it's, excuse me, it's all in kind of the same directions that we've been going. So, you know, we're just looking at how can we make this system scale even farther even more performant, more cost effective. Um, that's actually cost efficiency is a big area for us going forward. You know, people find that as as a business grows, you know, our as one of our customers, as their business grows, and as their application, their systems become more and more complex. You know, they're adding more and more functionality into their software and their stack. The log volume tends to grow exponentially, and and cost starts to become a real concern. And so some of the things we're looking at are how to provide more flexibility around which data is really critical, which data you need to keep, but you're not necessarily using all the time and you don't necessarily need to pay for the same level of service there. And and so just more broadly, how can we kind of let people continue to occupy this spot where with our solution, you just sort of throw all the data in and you can look at it in the ways you need to, when you need to, and without that cost, you know, continuing to grow as, as your application continues to get more sophisticated. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a big focus for us now. 
And if you look back at your career, you know, from getting acquired by Google to life after leaving the tech giant, what would you say is the most valuable lesson that you could pass on to a startup founder listening to us today? It could be at any stage of their uh, their startup journey. So I, I, I think two things jump out at me. One is, you know, you're, you're, you've probably heard the term imposter syndrome, you know, sort of feeling like, you know, you're not qualified to be doing what you're doing. You're not really a a CEO, you're not really a, you know, a, a leader, not really an engineer, you know, the product, you uh, don't believe it. Um, you know, I've, I've had that, you know, I've mentioned, you know, I've done a number of startups um, and I've wrestled with imposter syndrome, uh, you know, most of the way through and it's an easy trap to fall into. And the, the secret is everyone else also thinks they're an imposter. And, and so maybe you are an imposter, but that, but, you know, if everyone is an imposter, then, then no one is. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say. And so, you know, really, you know, if you feel like the thing you're trying to do is a thing you can do, then don't let context or your lack of some specific credential or experience or whatever trick you into thinking you you can't do it. You know, try to trust yourself. Um, And then but then the flip side of that is ask for a lot of help. Uh, you know, from from teammates, from people you know, from people you'd like to meet. Um, you know, none of us can do these things alone. And you know, one of the things I found really nice about the, the tech industry is people are really happy to help. You know, everyone got boosts on their way up, and most people are happy to to pay that forward. And um, so, you know, don't be shy about asking for help. Fantastic advice. And I'm so happy that you mentioned imposter syndrome there, because as someone that left the corporate IT management life behind, I must admit, I still struggle with imposter syndrome. I'm doing something that I absolutely love and I'm passionate about, but I'm almost waiting for someone just to tap me on the shoulder and say, that's it now. Can you go back to your day job, please? It just, it, I think it... Is it healthy, do you think, because it keeps you on your toes, but you always think it's going to be snatched away or you don't belong? You know, too much of a good thing is too much. Um, yes. you know, so I think you're right. It, it is healthy. It you know, keeps us honest uh, and it, it keeps us humble as long as you, you know, don't don't let it take you too far. Yeah. Um, actually, I just, I'd like to share a brief story, actually. This has reminded me. So way back in my career uh, with one of the same people I uh, I did rightly with, um, we built one of the first uh, web based or one of the first, sorry, uh, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, uh, web page builders. This was back in 96. And we were in the process of selling, uh, selling it to Claris, which was Apple's software arm at the time. And as we were negotiating the deal, someone from the Claris team mentioned that one of the things they were really excited about was bringing in a team, uh, meaning the two of us would build this editor, page editor, bringing in a team that really understood the internet. And I opened my mouth to say, actually, I don't know anything about the internet. This is just a, you know, a file editor that we built and it happens to be a file format that gets used on the internet, but we don't know anything about the internet. I opened my mouth to say that. And before the words came out, my, my brain, I almost felt like my brain reached down into my mouth, grabbed those words away. And instead what I said was, yeah, we're, you know, we're really excited about this too. And I literally drove from that meeting to the technical bookstore in Palo Alto and bought a stack of books on the internet. And, and you know what? It worked out from where they stood. We were internet experts. Fantastic. I love that story. Well, if there is anyone listening that want to follow the progress of Scalar, find you online, can you just point them in the direction of your website and also how they could contact a member of your team if they are left with any questions after listening to us today? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're just at scalar.com, S-C-A-L-Y-R.com. Uh, there's a contact link on the site, um, and you can find us under Scalar uh, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Excellent. Well, I'll add all those links to the show notes and the blog post that accompanies this podcast. I cannot thank you enough for coming on today. One of the reasons I record this show every single day is to try and inspire people that are going through a, possibly at the beginning of their startup journey and they're crippled with self-doubt and then limitations they place on themselves. And yes, sometimes imposter syndrome, but hearing someone's from you, hearing from someone such as yourself that have experienced fantastic success and realizing that, hey, you're just human too, and you've been through all those same fears and overcome them. I just know that there's going to be somebody listening, could be this week, next year, five years from now, that come across that recording, and it's the value that it offers that person. So thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy day to come and share that story with me today. Thank you very much. 
Imagine being the guy behind Google Docs and Google Drive and knowing how they're now used by 800 million people every day. That is what I call making an impact in the world through technology. And I loved hear Steve sharing his path to success from getting acquired by Google to actually going beyond that and life after leaving the tech giant. And it's great to hear him speaking passionately as well about that empathetic approach to leadership and innovation, including that moment that he knew when it was time to bring in a new CEO. Because I think that is an issue that technical founders often grapple with all the time, but very few actually talk about it openly. So Steve has shared his story and I offered my favourite takeaways from listening to that conversation. But now over to you. I mean, please keep those messengers coming over. Without it, I'm just a crazy brick guy talking into a microphone in a room all on his own. Everybody? Oh, <laughs> seriously, though, please email me techblogwriter at outlook.com. Tweet me at Neil C. Hughes. And my website, of course, is techblogwriter.co.uk. And also, I'm also going to ask if you could keep the ratings and reviews for the podcast coming in, as it really does help grow this show. And for new people listening, we're going to be celebrating our fourth anniversary next month. And in a few months' time, we're also going to be hitting 1,000 interviews with tech leaders in in around 50 to 60 different countries. So a very short rating or review would be really appreciated. And also, let me know when you very first started listening to the show, when you first discovered me. Was it episode one with John White four years ago? Or was it 501? I'd love to know. Let me know. Because I really do appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to tune into this podcast. I know there's a growing list of podcasts to listen to every day, so I really appreciate you stopping by. So before I get too emotional, I'm just going to say a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.